you're tuned into Masters of the Genre, where I, Cardinal Sin, take you right to the source of the most important genre creators of their generation. Authors, actors, directors, science fiction, fantasy, comics, film, and other creators that shape our genre fiction and entertainment. Get ready to leave the world of the everyday behind and go head to head with the masters of the genre. Welcome, welcome, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin, and today we have a hell of a show for you. We have on Masters of the Genre, two guests. One is Tracy Torme, and one is Mark Scott Zucree. And this is going to be a little like herding cats, but here we go. <laughs> Tracy is the son of famous singer Mel Torme, and Tracy graduated from the USC School of Cinema Television in 1979. His two early mentors were Joseph Stefano, creator of the original Outer Limits, and Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. Torme began his career as a writer on SCTV and Saturday Night Live during the show's 1982-83 season. In the late 80s, Torme also wrote for Star Trek The Next Generation for the first two seasons. His first season episode, The Big Goodbye, earned a Peabody Award. He later wrote and was associate producer on the 1988 film Spellbinder. Tracy Torme has written, consulted for, and produced many other TV shows and films, including Carnival, Odyssey 5, and he wrote for the early 2000s remake of The Outer Limits. Torme is perhaps best known as the co-creator and writer for the TV show Sliders. Torme also wrote the screenplay for the film about the Travis Walton abduction, Fire in the Sky, which was nominated for a Saturn Award for Best Writing in 1994. Torme also wrote the screenplay Intruders based on the Bud Hawkins book of the same name and produced UFO Cover-Up Live. Tracy served as an uncredited writer on the Jodie Foster movie Contact based on the Carl Sagan novel of the same name. Most recently, he wrote and co-created the 2020 UFO documentary The Phenomenon that was originally slated for wide theatrical release nationwide before the pandemic forced it to be released on video on demand and it can now be seen on Amazon Prime Video with a trial subscription to Discovery Plus. Our other distinguished guest is Mark Scott Zucri. Mark has written and produced hundreds of hours of C can't talk today of series TV pilots and feature films for most of the major studios and networks, including Paramount, Universal, Disney, Sony Columbia, TriStar, MGM, Warner's, Castle Rock, New Line, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, WB, UPN, Showtime, USA Network, Sci-Fi, the BBC, and many more. Among his credits are classic episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, Sliders, Babylon 5, Deep Space Nine, Friday the 13th, the series, Forever Night, Mentis, Space Precinct, and others. Mark's work has been nominated for the Hugo Award, American Book Award, Humanitas Prize, the Nebula Award, the Diane Thomas Award, and has won the prestigious Hamptons Prize, TV Guide Award, Rondo Award, the Saturn Award, and he has been nominated a Writers Guild Diversity Honoree. In 2019, he and his Space Command team were listed in Esquire's list of top celebrities at Comic-Con. Mark's landmark book, The Twilight Zone Companion, created the modern genre of books on TV series and inspired a generation of TV showrunners and filmmakers. The Companion was an instant bestseller, over half a million copies to date, and named by the New York Times one of 10 science fiction books for the ages, the only nonfiction book on the list. 
The extensively updated new edition has just been released by Silman James. Silman James will also be publishing his new book, Greenlighting Yourself. Also among Mark's recent books is Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, co-written with Guillermo del Toro for HarperCollins, which debuted as the number one movie book on Amazon. In addition, Mark is a lauded novelist with the best-selling Magic Time trilogy published by HarperCollins and Blackstone Audio. Additionally, Mark is currently creating the TV series in collaboration with Rockne O'Bannon. New TV series. Mark Fergus and Joe Doherty called the Showrunners Network. Mark and his wife, Elaine, are also founders and for the last 26 plus years have run The Table, which has provided a supportive community to thousands of industry professionals in Hollywood and around the world at no charge. Among many projects currently in prep, production, or post, they are writing, directing, and producing Space Command, starring Doug Jones, Mike Harney, John Hennigan, Christina Moses, Farin Tahir, James Hong, Bill Mooney, Robert Picardo, Armin Shimmerman, and Bruce Boxleitner. And you can learn more about the Zakris on Mark's Facebook and Twitter pages and on his YouTube channel, Mr. Sci-Fi. Welcome, Tracy Torme and Mark Scott Zakri. Glad to be Thank here. Thank you, Gil. Um, I guess we're out of time yeah. for the interview now, having read all of our credits. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been slumming it after listening to Mark's credits. Yeah, I was. I was I've just saying, get off and we don't. We don't need to hear all, all of my credits. But yeah. it's, it, you know, I've, <laughs> it, it, those people. What I've been doing the last uh, few years. If if <laughs> people, this is their first, you know, time to pretend that they're Captain Kirk. Uh, my dramatic pauses are not on purpose. If this is their first <laughs> exposure to you, I want to make sure that uh, they know all of the facts. And at the moment, I'm going to drop um, Mr. Sci-Fi, Mark, your YouTube channel into the chat. And I'll do it if you want. Everybody, I'll, I'll do it. check it out. Thanks, PJ. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's you such bet. an honor to have you both on the same screen. Yeah. It well, really so, is. Oh, thank you. It's so great because, you know, I, Tracy and I have not seen each other in many years. And, and I've always been a huge admirer. And by the way, Tracy... Uh, when I saw uh, Phenomenon, I rented it first, and I loved it so much, I bought a copy. It's, uh, I have the digital copy. It's a terrific documentary uh-huh. on, U- on UFOs. Everything that J.J. That, uh, Abrams' recent documentary failed to do correctly, uh, uh, Tracy's uh, documentary, it's just a wonderful documentary. I loved it from the beginning. Thank you. That's very nice. You know, I don't know if you know how – do you remember how we first met, Mark? No, I'm not sure. How, how did we first meet? You, you wrote a really beautiful letter to me out yes. of the blue when i was at star trek That's you right. had seen the big goodbye and yes. you wrote me this really wonderful letter so i knew you know of you from that and then i was such a big twilight zone fan and of course i got your book right away and then when i heard lo and behold you were going to be on the sliders staff after i left um that was the one piece of good news i got yes. that i was happy about <laughs> so yes that yes, it was, was Grimm's. We weren't even there at the same time, though. No, no, ships that passed yeah. in the night. Remember, whenever there yeah. was a, a continuity question or something, I would be the one who would be, you know, the one to call you. And you know, and right. you and I were first on on very good terms, very very friendly terms, and still are, of course. And you know, I'm I'm glad yes. we're both uh, both still active and doing things. So it's great. Right. It was uh, it was rough because Mark was always a gentleman, and he was a really talented guy. And he went to the staff and the t- just after, I guess, just after I'd left or something like yeah. that. But I was only there as the, quote, um, executive consultant on every episode. But otherwise, I had nothing to do with it. And um, right. I was happy that Mark was there. But it, w- it was a rough time for me because I didn't like uh, the direction that the uh, network wanted to go with the show. Um, yes. And then I, I'm curious about your experience with David Peckinpah. And I know he's dead now and no one wants to, you know, step on the grave of the dead. But I, <laughs> I'm curious how you got along with him or what you uh, 
experience with him and I'm asking for a reason, but let oh, me sure. just ask that sort of yeah. up front. And just to, just to put it in context, um, <clears throat> I'd seen the pilot of, uh, of Sliders at a screening when, when it was first made. And mm. uh, I liked it very much. And of course I liked Tracy very much. And, uh, and that was the only thing of Sliders I'd seen until I got hired mm. at the beginning of the fourth season. And this was mm -hmm. after Fox had canceled it and after Sci-Fi had picked it up for an additional season. And so we were given the task of trying to get it to work because there'd been so much, you know, uh, I guess, right. I don't know what the writer's room was like back back in the third season, but my understanding was that right. it was pretty, pretty bad. And, you know, with mm -hmm. David Peckinpah, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the most pleasant time, but <laughs> because I had so many ideas and because I knew the genre so well, they kind of let me have a lot of creative input and the scripts that I wrote or rewrote, um, they didn't fuck with. So... Uh, mm -hmm. So that was good. So creatively, I, I, like on the 22 episodes that we did that year, I'd say I was sort of uh, the machine that made it go on about 19 of them. And oh, wow. uh, whether that was coming up with the idea, structuring it, you know, writing it, rewriting it, you know, I, 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 most of the, I'm, I'm credited, I think, on four or five of them. And then the others, I didn't take credit because when it's a freelancer, even if you do a page one, mm -hmm. you don't call jump because that takes away his residuals, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh but yeah, but but yeah, absolutely. Feel free to ask me anything. But Chris Chris Black was the other story editor that he worked right. with. Right. He, he was fine to work with, but and and, nice and guy. Bill, yeah, I mean David only really wrote the first episode of that season and then he was mainly the right. other guy. And so it was mainly Chris Black and Bill Dial and me. We were the entire writing staff and Bill came off right. of Bill, Yeah. Bill Go Dial ahead. used to call me he used to call me quite frequently too with uh questions and stuff and he seemed like a very earnest guy, wanted yeah. to do the right thing. Well, the, um, thing that was, the thing that was cool about him was that he came off WKRP in Cincinnati. He was primarily a comedy hmm. writer, but he also had a, a huge knowledge of history. And so he wasn't hmm. really a science fiction guy, but he had really good ideas and a very different take on things. So it was a good mix because Chris Black and I were science fiction nerds and Star Trek nerds and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and we were taking pitches every day. As you, as you know, we had 11 freelance slots and uh, 22 episodes to make. So yeah. um, it was, you know, it was, I, I liked it very much. And, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, my goal was just to make a show that would track, you know, and that, that, that I, that I loved. Right. You know? and, and I knew that it wasn't going to be your vision because, you know, un unless one is the showrunner and really hands on, you can't keep control of a show, you know, as you, you and I both know. I mean, Rod Serling was able to do mm -hmm. that with Twilight Zone, but certainly not with Night Gallery. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, but so I think I really felt sympathy for you at the time that <laughs> it, it's like it's like having your child kidnapped and then they're raising, <laughs> raising him to be like a drug lord or something. You know, it's like yeah. and you're, you're just sitting there going, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, it was a great source of comfort to me that you were on the staff. Thanks. You and I had already met and respected yeah. each other tremendously. And uh, I was glad that you were there. You know, yeah. it was a really tough job probably, Mark, because first of all, during the first couple of seasons, we were trying to do a weird mix of black comedy and satire yes. with sort of straightforward science fiction. And we tried to kind of combine the two. Mm -hmm. And it was a tough thing for the networks to get their arms around. Um, mm -hmm. They were always very uneasy with the uh, comedy and the satire aspects i'll never forget i used to write music for the show pretty frequently mm. and wow. i wrote a rap song on a world where we were saying that um education had been elevated and nerds were like i the remember kings. that episode i remember yeah, that rap we wrote song. A, i wrote a rap song about going to the library done mm. sort of gangster rap style <laughs> and it ran coming right out of a commercial <laughs> and it turns out that after it ran a lot of people had thought that it was a public service announcement and they hadn't even realized it was part of the show. <laughs> so funny. I was on cloud nine. I thought, wow, how cool. Yeah. We really hit high mark. And the very next day, the network was all over me for it and explaining, you know, that's why we don't want to do comedy with science fiction. Right. And so it was like a, before Mark even came on board in the first three seasons, it was really kind of comedic. I was, fighting with the network every week and it was kind of like a case of when i felt like i'd won it was when i got you know 80 percent of what i wanted to do in and 
when I felt like it was 30%, I hadn't won, but uh-huh. it was a battle every week. And yeah. I was, you know, I was enjoying it. I wasn't not enjoying it. But then my agents told me that I was starting to get the reputation for being, quote, difficult. Yes. And that's when I kind of knew that it was going to be more of a battle. And I'm telling this for a reason, Mark. The mm-hmm. third season, shortly before you came on, um, when Peckinpah came on, mm-hmm. I was really hopeful. But I tried and tried and tried for a good part of the year saying, David, you and I need to sit down and talk about the characters. You're yes. new to the show. So let's at least talk about, oh, yeah, we'll do that. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get to it. And he did that to me about five or six different times. Now yeah. the show is like almost halfway through the season. And he and I haven't even really put our heads together. Every time hmm. I see him, he's putting golf balls in his office and huh. not really seem to be paying too much attention. Make a long story yeah. short. Wow. Um, through the middle of the third season, I wrote an episode called The Guardian. And to this day, it's my favorite episode because it was very personal to me. It's about Quinn meeting his dead father who's right. alive on the world he goes to. And uh, there's a whole reason why time works that way on that world. Mm-hmm. But he ends up becoming a guardian to his younger self on that right. world to protect right. himself from bullies. That was what mm-hmm. the story was about. So I really love that episode. And Leonard Nimoy's son directed it, Adam uh-huh. Nimoy. And uh, when the first dailies came out, I was so excited to see them. And I uh, watched them with David Peckinpah. It's one of the first times we had watched an episode together. And as soon as it finished, I was really you know, excited about it. And all he did was say, well, that's exactly the kind of show we're not going to be doing this season. <laughs> and at that very moment, I knew... Yeah that I was out of there because my contract was up in Mm -hmm. like a few weeks or week. And uh, David was very open when he came on board saying he'd been told by the network that the show was too cerebral. (laughs) That's the term that he used. And that was great by the way, Tracy, because there was a, there was a twist on that. Like toward the end of the episode, there was a twist on that episode. That was a great episode. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I love that episode too. uh, If I may. That's what they said yeah. about the first Star Trek pilot. It was yeah. too cerebral. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I take again, that as a badge of honor. But well, the thing um, is that so that's yeah. when I decided that I was leaving. And hmm. so Mark's right. You know, when you create something and then it gets taken over by other hands, it's never going to be easy for you. And no. No. probably I was pretty hard on the the regime once I left. Basically, because I didn't respect what David was doing. No. Um, and so I kind of kept my hands off. Um, as Mark knows, I, I really wasn't involved with really any of the uh, sc- yeah. scripts yeah. or um, stories during but, those but two it's, seasons. But, so. you know, but, it's but Mark, I'm sure, did a great job. And mm. Yeah, well, sorry, go ahead. It was, it's very interesting to hear the side of it, Tracy, because when I came on, you know, the, the show had sort of crashed and burned on Fox by the end of that third season. Mm-hmm. And and sci-fi had picked it up. So it was a completely different uh, group of executives, ones who actually wanted it to be a science fiction show. And because right. I, always felt, I always felt there was such a great premise. And, and mm. what I was looking at in the later part of the third season were all these movie ripoffs, where it was sort of like whatever was a hit movie, whether it was Twister or Jurassic Park, they right. do go to that world and i said we're not going to do that anymore we're not going to rip off movies because this is such a great anaconda and jurassic park yes and and i said i said because i remembered your pilot which i liked and uh and i said we're this is a great science fiction premise and we're going to live up to that premise and we met with uh all of the leads on the show like the first week individually and said what do you think's working with with the show what do you think's not working with the show and then i went to the world science fiction convention and i met with the fans uh, because mm-hmm. the, you know, on the internet, everyone was saying this, which should stay dead, and blah blah blah, because they weren't happy with how how it had gone down. And I said, "Tell mm-hmm. me everything. Tell me everything." So we packed a room full of the fans, and I said, "Tell tell me everything you don't like about the show." And they told us, and That's I said, cool. "Well, we're gonna." We're, I, I said, "We're gonna fix it. Come back and give us a chance." And they did. And the the, the oh, premiere, episode, yeah, yeah, but it, I think. That. But I think it was because Peck and Pa was much more involved with actually the, the nuts and bolts of showrunning because he he let the writing staff kind of 
you know, he trusted us to do the show. And, um, and that was very, very good. But I think in, um, indicative of his aesthetic with quotes around it is uh, there was a point where I was, uh, I was prepping an episode of mine that I'd written and they were, they canceled the TV show time cop and they had these amazing sets. And I, mm. uh, I came up with a sliders episode that would use those sets. They were just going to tear them down. I said, no, no, put a pin in it. And mm. Jerry O'Connell was directing that episode. episode it was called mm. Slide King. So I was giving Jerry a tour of the sets to say where I was placing different things in the script. And meantime, David took up pitch and, and he said, well, we, you know, we've bought this clone story. And I said, and he told me what the clone story was. And I said, every other science fiction show on the air has done that story. I, I urged him not to buy it. And he said, yes, but mm. we haven't done it. And I said, yes, but the fans are watching all the other shows. They're not just watching our show. And, and mm. ultimately, I, I had to end up rewriting that script and trying to put some kind of freshness mm. into it. But I think that attitude of, you know, uh, aiming, aiming for mediocrity is uh, very problematic. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. I was, told, I was told a story about that one of the last two seasons. Uh, Mark, I wonder if you tell me if it's true. I was told, sure. some insider told me this that there was an episode where it was about bikers <laughs> and that what happened was the amount of footage was way short. So they had to show the bikers going in and out of town over and over again. Yeah, and man. someone said, why did they even do this story? Then I was told that Peck and Paul had a girlfriend <laughs> and he basically did the biker story to give her a bit part on the show. And then it was underwritten. So, they finally had to keep redoing the same shot over and over of the bikers going in and out of the town. Does any, any of that make sense? Well, Do you, well, I was, you remember I was that the, episode? No, because I was on the fourth season. Okay. And then, they, then when they came back for a fifth, that was when Jerry, you know, left. Jerry, Jerry O'Connell. Directing and stuff, they wanted, yeah. They wanted me to come back as a consultant, and I declined at that point. So I wasn't mm -hmm. on the fifth season. Just because I thought without Jerry, it's going to be very problematical. And also... I'd had sort of enough of working with with David Peckinpah, quite frankly, and uh, mm -hmm. so I, I turned that gig down. And Elaine and I, my wife and I, went off and did a pilot with Tom Fontana. But uh, mm -hmm. but you know, again, I I I would certainly find that possible because again, you know, if people, <laughs> unless your unless your artistic desire is to create something amazing and wonderful, then you're going to do all all that sort of nonsense. You know, it's it's like oh yeah. well, I, I remember one time I um, there was a TV show and the story editors slash producers to asked me to come up with a script set on a on a liner, like an ocean liner. So I, I really worked it up. And then I came in and pitched it and they said, well, we've changed our mind. We, we mainly just want to do a show on an ocean liner so we could be on an ocean liner. Then let's <laughs> go on and speak with the families. And I said, Jesus, oh, you, just, you just wasted my time. You know, it's like, that's, yeah. that's not the, you know, Jesus. But, but now, of course, I think, I, I don't know if you know, but now I have my own studio and I have my own, channel on on youtube and i my fans gave me three million bucks to make a new show and i'm i'm doing it wow. so, holy hannah so that's amazing. great mark but, yeah and i just and so I while i can get a word in edgewise oh, sure, please. <laughs> i just want to highlight this comment i can't pronounce the name but it says we have a lot of sliders fans in russia we are mm -hmm. awaiting news about the continuation for more than 20 years Wow. And as fun as it has been to catch up, we have a ton of people who are here to listen about sliders. So, Tracy, let's yeah. dive right in. We're okay. here to talk about sliders, the show you co-created and that Mark worked on later. Tracy, fans are very excited about the prospect that you are bringing back sliders. And it's not only a continuation, but they're bringing back the original cast. How's it coming? And how is creating a show in the early 21st century different from creating one in the late 20th century? Well, uh, up until the last like a week, we've been working on a reboot of the show. <clears throat> um, we come up with a storyline that makes sense. I can give a little bit of it away. Everyone that is, was into sliders knows that the timer was damaged on the original slide and now it's working sporadically and what it does is every planet they land on it tells them how long they have until the window opens again and gives them a chance to escape and if they miss that window they're stuck in that world pretty much forever huh. so what we're doing is saying that they've been stuck on a planet 
25 years. Hmm. And that's why they're older or in some cases, maybe even dead. And uh -huh. using that premise, it's that they're on a world where the window is about to open and they're about to be a, get a chance to get off that world. And then we go sliding again with uh, two of the original characters hmm. and three new characters. So right. there's five sliders on the new, uh, the new creation. So to make a long story short, we were working really hard on it. We had two meetings with what used to be Universal Studios. They've morphed into something else. And <laughs> we had, yeah. and I'm sure Mark knows all about that. We, yeah. uh, we ended up having two meetings with them. They were pretty good meetings. We thought they were going to say, here's several million bucks. Get it going again. Instead, they've said, well, we're kind of wondering why now? Why is now the right time for sliders? <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, uh, we think you, we should sit on it for a little while and then meet again and see where we go from there. So mm -hmm. at one point I was very optimistic and you know, was te telling anyone that was asking that we're about to launch again. And mm -hmm. now the launch has been paused and where it goes from here, I don't know, but we are definitely still planning to uh, meet again with the powers that be uh, maybe in so, a month or two and see well, where it goes. You, you um, haven't found a home for sliders yet. Uh, that's one way to look at it. But the problem is the people that we pitch to are the people that apparently own all the rights. Yes. Ah, um, I see. The creators yeah. don't own the rights. Uh, Fox Network doesn't own the rights. Mm -hmm. It's the morphed uh, elements of what was Universal Studios. Yes. They gotcha. own the rights we can't proceed without them. So <laughs> I'm not getting too up or down by about it because I've been in this game for a long time, but um, yeah. I still am optimistic that when all the dust settles, we'll have a reboot of the show. And I think the fans will really like the uh, reboot because it's very, very uh, faithful to the rules of sliding that we established a long time ago. And it maintains the original atmosphere of a mixture of sort of satire and science fiction action adventure that's mm -hmm. really what we're going for so okay hopefully Tracy, you. good luck real yeah. quick thank this you this has been a question since our earlier show <laughs> with mm -hmm. captain cockney spock about the prisoner mm -hmm. it's from intensified a question that I have for Tracy about sliders is regarding whether the potential reboot will address which Arturo slid yeah. in post-traumatic slide syndrome. I've been wondering since great. I was seven years old. <laughs> That's a wonderful question because I had so much fun putting that little twist into that story. I knew it was going to be that we, the fans will wonder who the hell, which Arturo slid and which one was left behind. We even threw in a little bit of something that was a little bit of a tease because when Arturo goes through the, 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 the wormhole and we don't know which one he is, as soon as he lands on the next world, he says, oh, no. And we put that in to make people think the wrong Arturo slid. So, it's yes, I'm well aware of that. of, oh, boy, <laughs> from Quantum Leap. Yeah, that's a really great question. You know your stuff to ask that question. Um, and I can tell you that one of our one of our four original main characters is dead mm -hmm. at the time of the new show. Mm -hmm. There's a whole reason why that happened. And there's also uh, an offspring of Quinn and Wade, mm -hmm. which is going to interest some of the fans. Mm -hmm. So um, it's some interesting stuff and I hope we get to do it. It'd be a lot of fun mm -hmm. and it would be an interesting uh, time to be able to do sort of that black comedy satire because there's so much going on in the world right now that needs to be satired. Yes. So I think it would be, uh, it would be pretty interesting. I'd love to do it. Tracy, Another question certain... for you, Tracy comes from Jason yeah. Cohen. Tracy, do you read the sliders sub form on Reddit? Lots of good ideas out there. I occasionally from time to time have read some of the, uh, the, the stuff on the internet of um, there's a guy named Matt 
Hatoff or Hatoff, who runs a, a one that has a really um, ingenious title. It, one of them, I think, is called Earth Prime, and the mm -hmm. other one is called something like Continuum of Worlds or something. Mm -hmm. So I do occasionally dabble in all of that, but the one you just mentioned, I'm not sure by that name that I've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. But if you think it's something I should look at, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to contact me. Um, hey, 50,000 Sliders fans can't be wrong, right? <laughs> I'd love to look at it, though. Thanks for turning me on to that. Mm, mm, cool. Um, and our friend from Russia says, I'm 38 years old and I started watching the series in 1997. So mm. there you go. And it go. runs in, in, in Russian language? Apparently, wow. apparently so. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. I but didn't see, this, even know that. That's fantastic. But, but see, this is the great thing about science fiction that it really does have a worldwide appeal. And, you know, I think, but, but, you know, lately I've started talking about executives and all these things. One of the sayings I've come up with recently just to react to some of these things is like, stupid people are stupid. You know, it's like, because <laughs> why, why? I love that line in Plan yeah. 9 from Outer Space, Mark. <laughs> you yeah. people of Earth are stupid. Yeah. But it's, it, when an executive says, why now for sliders? The real answer yeah. is because it's a great show. It's a great idea. It has a built-in audience. And people will love it. That's that's the answer. And the and the and the yeah, frustration. Well, yeah, but the frustration, of course, is that the the studios and the networks insist on owning the IP. So you know, if, if you have right. to want to do anything with Star Trek, you got to go through CBS slash Paramount with Twilight Zone at CBS as well. You know, it's like they own these things. For instance, there's a there are two pilot scripts that Rod Serling wrote for Twilight Zone that never got shot. They're hour long mm. scripts. And I would love to shoot those, but, but oh, yeah. oh gosh, um, owns, owns them and that's that. And so they may never see the light of day. And that's really a shame. What are they called? One is, I, called, I, mm -hmm. one is called the happy place. Just, yeah. Oh. And, the, and the other one's no, called, I shot, yeah, it's, the other one's called, I shot an arrow into the air, but it's not the same as the episode that was made with that title. It's a completely oh, different story. I love that episode, by the way. Not yeah. the same, and like also, that. please, everyone in the chat, subscribe to my wonderful co-host, PJ's channel, Orville Nation. Yes. You can look him up on YouTube at Orville Nation. If you want to do a screen grab, the very long uh, URL is on the screen. Uh, and can, uh, I'll let you guys get back to it. Before I forget, Gil? Yeah. Um, Mark, can you uh, can you show us that? Is that a new Space Command shirt you have on? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's one of the issues of the comic book. Let me sh let me see if I can get it on camera here. It's yeah, it's, nice. it's oh the, wow, yeah, it's it's a it's an illustration by Ian McCaig, who designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala. He's our character designer on Space Command. But one wow. of the reasons, one of the reasons I did Space Command independently was because I own the IP on all the projects I'm doing now. I own the IP, mm. and and if a studio or network wants to buy the show. You know, one has to deal with that issue, but but I'm, I just got very tired of having to ask permission on things I did, and now uh, now I have the freedom where I can write it, cast it, shoot it, get it out. Now my own. they have to go through you first. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, it's great fun. I mean, you you can tell with both Tracy and myself that we have a a, a passion and a joy for for what we do. This is you know we're not we are not halfway people. We are not lukewarm people. We are where people just love this. And I mean, that's why I loved your, your documentary on, on the phenomenon, you know, because again, it's clear that there's a knowledge and a passion and, and, and also um, a scrupulousness. In other words, you're, you're making sure that the material you're presenting um, is, is, is convincing is, you know, you've done your homework. It's not, it's not. Well, Mark, um, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, please. And this is I'm, for another one of Gil's shows, but I can tell you that right now, I'm absolutely up to my neck in UFO stuff. There's all mm. kinds of things happening as we speak. And it's, yeah. it is like a Twilight Zone episode or science yes. fiction movie in a lot of ways. I also wanted to say to you real quick, as much as I am in love with your Twilight Zone handbook, and I really do keep it right by my bed because I'm referencing it all the time. Um, I was such a Twilight Zone fan that that slipped into sliders without even intentionally doing yeah. it. And what I mean is I love we started it. doing sliders in the first and second season where 
there were almost every episode had a twist ending. There was mm. always something <laughs> where coming right to the end, it kind of took a left hand turn. Mm. And that was totally from the Twilight Zone. I, di I didn't even yeah. realize it. It was just ingrained in me that yeah. that's one of the things that I love so much about the Twilight Zone is the twist endings. And uh, I was telling Mark also, I'm telling Gil that my wife had Gil, really not Mark, seen. whatever. You can yeah, confuse us. I'll get it it's straight. Right. I, don't like it. I was telling Gil that my wife was not that much of a Twilight Zone fan at all. Mm. And so we kind of made it, had a little. Grounds uh, for not getting married, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we, we've been together for 20 years now. And over those 20 years. Mazel we just watched. Thank you, thank you. We've watched every Twilight Zone. And, wow. you know, when she hadn't seen one, I'd say, oh, my God, here's such and yeah. such. you got to see this one. Sooner okay. or later, we've pretty much seen all of them. And wow. uh, it's fun to go back and see them all again. And I always use your book as a guide, when I, especially when I have a question about something. Yeah. Well, I just, I just now, did indispensable. Again, if I can jump in, well, and it's please, my channel, yeah. damn it. So, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, okay. There was a question I wanted to ask you, Mark, sure. uh, and it has to do with your uh, new Twilight Zone commentaries Kickstarter campaign yeah. coming up. Yeah. What can yeah. you tell yeah. us about that? Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, thanks for thanks for mentioning that, Gil. Um, uh, you know, I, essentially, as as Tracy's mentioned, and, uh, uh, you know, I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, and I just did the third edition um, about a year mm -hmm. ago. That has a hundred more pages and five hundred new photographs and links to audio and video and all that stuff, but um, but when I produced the Twilight Zone Blu-ray set, I've, done, I've I've worked on all of the home video versions of Twilight Zone from the beginning, and um, I did fifty-two episode commentaries, but that still leaves hundred and four I hadn't done, and mm. uh, you know, and because we're actively shooting movies and and TV shows and so forth, I'm always looking for ways to ways to raise money, and I thought, well, I'll do a Kickstarter campaign. To, to do all 104 commentaries, which people will get as audio downloads. And so they can watch the episode and listen to me and my guests, mm. whoever I choose to have with me. Great idea. Um, talking about the episode. Yeah. And and to promote that, we now have a website called twilightzonecommentaries.com. And on Mr. Sci-Fi, I've started doing what I call the Twilight Zone Minute, where every day for a few minutes, I talk about a different episode. I'm going, I started at the beginning with Where Is Everybody? And I'm going to do all 156, just kind of like off the top of oh, my head. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's very fun. It's very fun because it's oh, hard watching. You know? yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, Mark, does that mean that the Blu-ray set of the Twilight Zone doesn't have all your commentaries on it or you don't have commentaries on every single episode? That's right. I did 52 commentaries. I had previously done two for the DVD set, and then I did 50 more for the Blu-ray. And, and they also excerpt a lot of my materials because, you know, I interviewed so many of the people who worked on the show, and I found uh, recordings of Rod Serling teaching classes where he would talk about Twilight Zone. And, uh, but, uh, but there's still 104 I haven't done in it. And so it was uh, – so I thought I, – I always intended to do the rest of them at some point because I, I have – you know so much knowledge about the show and these were and there's so many stories that were told to me by the people who made the show that aren't even in the twilight zone companion because it's just you know there's a physical limit to how long a book can be and i thought well i really should share this uh while i'm still around and uh so that's that's definitely the plan so we'll be launching that campaign probably within the month so after the kickstarter pays out and you get to make all the new commentaries yes. They do the 4K discs of the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Those are all going to be on there, right? Who knows? We'll see what happens. Huh. I, should, I, should, I should talk to CBS Home Video and see what they want to do. But uh, <laughs> but again, it's sort of like, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm here to do the things that interest me. And obviously, I have a passion for the Twilight Zone. One of the projects I'm working on now is called Rod Serling's After Twilight because you know uh, Rod used to dictate all of his scripts, all of his speeches, all of his letters, and he had that amazing style in every right. everything he did. Well, they thought that all those dictation uh, recordings were lost, and they just found uh, right. three hundred. They found found three hundred hours of them, and so I'm I'm wow. I'm pitching a new oh, show okay. called. I'm pitching oh, a new that's show. amazing. Yeah, well, there's a new show I'm pitching called Rod Serling's After Twilight that would be narrated by Rod. It would include scripts of Rod's that have never been seen, uh, or at least not seen since this, the 50s live TV uh. days, and also scripts that he wrote that never got made. And then it would also include scripts by sort of the luminaries, the, the Neil Gaimans and those kind of people now, as well as... Picture, if you will. 
Yes. A box and, of 300 hours of previously yes. unseen <laughs> recordings. That's right. And so I'm so I'm oh. currently in discussion with uh, Rod's daughters. And, what and, happened to that uh, Tyler? The, the pilot that what didn't happened get to that it? Tyler Perry Twilight oh. Zone that was supposed to be on? I don't, I don't know. They did that one with Did they Jordan ever make Peele. any of those? They did, they, no? did two seasons, two, they did two seasons with Jordan Peele running mm -hmm. it. But it wasn't that great. Oh, issue. what a dreadful, horrible yeah. thing to do to the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Well, you know, but see, the lovely thing is because we work in a media. I never saw any of them. Yeah, but because we work in a medium. Please, medium, Tracy, yeah. please never watch it. Huh. But because we work in a medium that lasts, we okay. can still I'll, see I'll what Rod, we can see what we, but we can see what Rod did whenever we want. And that's a wonderful thing, you know, mm -hmm. that, that his work that's true. Lasts, and it's and it's still wonderful. Well, I, I however. Don't I told my wife recently one, one that, thing, Mark, mm, that oh, yeah, I sorry. wasn't sure what was going to happen. Yeah, was when I watched Star Trek Picard. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was going to ruin Star Trek: The Next Generation <laughs> when I went back to watch it. Right, and <laughs> the very first episode that I went back to. I mean, I'd been doing a rewatch before I watched. Yes. You know, Star Trek Picard seasons one and two. And then I went back to the next episode in the rewatch and I was like, I I I know where this ends up. I, I can't stand this anymore. Mm -hmm. And Mark, mm -hmm. I must admit, I'm not a fan of modern Trek. Mm -hmm. I notice on your YouTube page you do your best to be an apologist for Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks. But it seems that you share my perspective that it just isn't Star Trek. Yeah, it's I'm written not, by people yeah. that don't understand Star Trek for people mm -hmm. that never watched Star Trek to the degree that you feel mm -hmm. comfortable talking about it. When did modern Star Trek go off the rails and do you think it will ever return to Gene's vision or is Star Trek as we knew it gone? Well, you know, the Star Trek universe uh, is such a wide and wonderful area for storytelling. It just needs the people who can utilize that storytelling well and effectively and meaningfully. But but I'm not so much an apologist for Discovery and Picard as I'm aware that people are trying their best within their abilities. And if they're failing, it's probably not for lack of trying. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. but I agree that those shows are not working. They certainly don't work for me. And, um, but but I think of, of Star Trek as sort of like, you know, like the works of William Shakespeare or something where, you know, you'll get a, a shitty Hamlet and then and then someone will do a good one. You know, it's like or Sherlock Holmes where you get a bad <laughs> Sherlock Holmes movie and then you get a really good one. And so I hmm. so I know that there will be good Star Trek shows down down the I mean, well, you know, Tracy was talking about how we first met. And I should mention that because the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, people don't you remember this, but it was like bad episode after bad episode after bad episode and and picard was always surrendering and there was it's just the characters <laughs> the characters didn't know who the hell they were and there was uh, you know and then all of a sudden there was the <laughs> big goodbye the big goodbye right and it was the first episode of star trek yeah. extra generation that just worked from beginning to, get to end it was a wonderful episode and that's why i wrote tracy a letter saying i really thought you did a great job because it was the first episode that showed the potential of that series and the potential was so great but it needed someone who could it, it's like it's like it's like someone driving a car you know someone someone might get behind the wheel and careen out of control and hit all the pedestrians and someone else might be able to drive and actually get you safely to your destination you know yeah. it's the same with writers you know? i still remember what a wonderful what a wonderful letter you you wrote me very Thanks. appreciated and yeah. uh that was an easy episode to do because uh, I always loved Raymond Chandler and I got a chance to kind of do a Raymond Chandler type of story. And then on yes. top of that, the holodeck was something that was in uh, theoretically in the Bible and no one had really done anything with it yet. And I thought, boy, this holodeck, if it's done right, could really be a lot of fun. So it was yeah. a fun episode and your letter was much, much appreciated. Um, well, thank you. I also wanted to tell you that when I was a little kid, my dad, for a period of time, became pretty good buddies with Rod Serling uh, uh -huh. because they had worked on a Playhouse 90 show yes. called The Comedian, yes. which is an it amazing show. It was a script by Rod Serling. Oh, that's where the pilot for the Jordan Peele Twilight Zone came from. That was yeah. the name of the, the pilot. But it's a different thing. The comedian was a playhouse. Oh, Mel, Mel, Torme, Mel Torme was terrific in it. But, but please go ahead. Thank you. You know, you knew that 
So my dad and Mickey Rooney played brothers. And mm. uh, Kim Hunter, future Planet of the Apes, she's yes. in it. Uh, you know, it was a pretty amazing <laughs> group of people. And my dad got to be friends with Rod Serling. And he kind of became Uncle Rod at our house because he would uh -huh. stop over at various times of, of night. And I remember one of my earliest memories, I could not have been more than about four years old, was uh -huh. being all excited because Rod was getting off work at CVS and was mm. going to be stopping by. And I wow. can still remember watching him with a cigarette dangling from his uh. fingers. And I was kind of fascinated by his cigarette, the way it was burning. Yeah. Believe wow. it or not, I still have that memory in my mind for no uh. good reason. But well, I'll, I'll you, he was I'll quite a great Mark, guy. How cool is that? I'll tell you a funny story about the comedian. Yeah. I, I heard this uh, when they were rehearsing the comedian. It's about Mickey Rooney plays an extremely neurotic and uh, uh, vitriolic man. Uh, and, and Mel Torme, I guess, in addition to being his mm -hmm. brother, is also like his manager or something. He's somewhere involved in the business of ours. And there's a scene in the Rod. His weak brother. Yeah. And so, and so there's a scene where, where Mickey Rooney just kind of basically, uh, you know, eviscerates him verbal verbally so someone was in the next in another studio adjacent studio listening to them rehearse and they didn't know it was a, a play and they thought jesus why is mickey rooney beating up on on mel torme Gee, <laughs> christ so, <laughs> that's a totally true story but you know yeah. the punchline of that story is the no, guy no, that no, overheard no. them and saw them was jack benny wow believe oh, it or not it was jack benny yeah wow he's the one that's that saw them and he said, oh, my God, why is Mickey Rooney beating up on Mel Torme? Because the <laughs> rehearsal was so realistic. Pretty funny. Yeah, that's great. Pretty that's funny. Great. Yeah. 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 But I mean, but and my again, dad yeah. always thought. Yeah. So go ahead. No, no, please, please. I go ahead. Gonna, I was just going to say my dad always thought that Rod was just such a genius. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's interesting, Mark, is now you and I are writers and everything that Sometimes I'll see a Twilight Zone and I will think to myself, oh, my God, that was Rod when he was really tired. Because you can mm. see certain things in the script and you got to mm -hmm. realize the guy has been putting out so many scripts, so much yes. work. The tell, yes, yes. the tell for me that it was a tired Rod Serling script is when he, people keep calling each other Mr every five minutes. <laughs> Let me tell you this, Mr. So-and-so, or Mr. This he uses Mr. over and over and over. And I'm yes. thinking, oh, if he was not tired, he would immediately have edited that out. But it's yes. still in the script. So I think yeah. there was a time when he just had too much, you know, work on his hands. But the yes. amount yes. of stuff that he turned out is just, is unbelievable. And, uh, and of course, I'm a huge Richard Matheson fan. So yes, that's he's yeah. my favorite writer probably of all time. Wow, uh, well, then, Tracy. Um, there's a quick question from the yeah. Sliders fan blog, who was with us earlier on. Okay. I am not a number. Tracy was the original mm -hmm. Sliders shot on film. Do you think it could be remastered in HD with the CGI? Yes, it was all shot on film. And technically what the, the way to do that and the problems with doing that, I'm really not an expert. I'm not sure. But yes, it was all. I have a guy. I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You, usually, usually the way it worked back, that back then, that was, an, that was a period where often what they would do is they'd film the episode on, on 35 millimeter, but then they would do the visual effects in post-production. And those might be separate film elements or eventually they moved into video. So one has to go back and crack open all of those elements and, you know, and either recreate the CG elements or, um, or upscale. Hmm. But see, the great thing is the 35 millimeter is such a high quality visual medium that, that it transfers terrifically well to 4K. And they, they can now clean up those prints, hmm. take out all the scratches and all that stuff. It's, uh, it's like, for instance, when we did the Twilight Zone Blu-ray, they went back to the, the original 35 hmm. millimeter negatives. And so that's why they look so Well, you know what, Mark? Um on the previous show I did with Gil, uh, we, we were watching The the Prisoner. Yes. And the, uh, the, the uh, remastered version is just amazing. It looks like it was just made yesterday. Really, wow. really good. Literally. Wow. Yeah, seeing. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Were you a fan uh, of that show? 
Yeah, yes, I, I was a huge fan of it. In fact, Elaine and I, my wife and I, stayed at Port Marion in, in Wales where they shot the prison. Oh, no yeah. way. It's wow, just, that's amazing. It's, amazing. it's amazing to go there because you see how phenomenally, brilliantly they used every little bit of that because that wasn't that mm -hmm. that community wasn't built for the prisoner it was built by this this architect who uh -huh. just was salvaged all these buildings that were going to be demolished from all over the place and it's incredibly charming but it's small and so the fact that i did, mean every little did it cost you an arm and a leg to go there no it wasn't it wasn't that expensive it's just no. a little difficult to get to mm -hmm. But it was just mm -hmm. wonderful, and uh, I'll tell you something funny because they mm. they run prisoner episodes on closed circuit, uh, you know, twenty four seven, and so they were showing oh, wow. us two. They were showing us two possible rooms we could um, choose from, and <laughs> as we went into one room, the uh, the the maitre d or the you know wh whoever he was uh, turned the manager turned on the uh, the lights and the TV came on showing the prisoner, and then the prisoner theme started playing, and we assumed it was just the stereo system, but it was actually a brass band. In the in the oh common area, and it started playing just in that wow. moment. It was it was magical. It was magical. No, oh, that must have been amazing. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I may, and, gentlemen, huh. before we before we get uh, just too far away from Star Trek, and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but um, the fact that uh, Terry Metalis, new showrunner for Picard, worked with Berman, does mm. that inspire any confidence to to either of you? No. Not no. Um, I mean. Go ahead. Well, I'm just uh, just to jump in, and then you can give your two cents. No, I mean, I've got nothing to say. Go. Yeah, I, I I'm not down on anybody trying to fix a broken engine, you know. And uh, I because th because you know all it needs is the right people to get in there. I mean, the actors are solid. There's 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 enormous talent in production design and VFX in so many departments, and so much money. It's like over it's like ten million dollars an episode, and so all you need is the right the correct writers with the correct vision, the correct ability to tell a story, and then and then the people in power to get out of their way. But but all it takes is one person in power who's an idiot, or and I shouldn't even say an idiot, just someone in power who who you know gums up the works to make something go to someone who's ignorant well, of the process. You know, but, you know, it's 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 it people often don't realize how much it takes to make a show actually work. You know, it's it mm -hmm. takes such a mixture of the right cast, the correct writers, the correct um, directors, good good score. I mean, and and enough money to make it correctly, and and ing ingenuity. I mean, and and a good mm -hmm. heart and a mm -hmm. desire to say something. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, you there's so many people who just don't have what it takes to make a show that's even coherent, <laughs> let alone good. You know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I, but it's a shame. It's, I, you know, I'd love for them to give me a call and say, "Hey, why don't you come in and work on this show on Star Trek?" Because I'd, I'd love to have a shot at it. I, it might, it might defeat me too. But I'd like, I'd love to have uh, the keys to that car. You bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know if you have an opinion on that, Tracy, but uh, you know, I, I know that the, that show in particular has had a lot of problems. Um, we yes. were actually kicking around doing a Dixon Hill story, which going back to the big goodbye with yeah. uh, on Picard. And for a whole number of reasons, I never really got beyond the uh, fiddling with an outline stage of it. Um, oh, thank goodness. You know, one of the things I'm sure most people are aware of is uh, Patrick Stewart's in his eighties now. Yes. I mean, it's yes. a pretty old and guy to be the lead. Even the more show. important than that, mm -hmm. he's an actor, not a fan, hmm. not a writer, and the way that they got him back to do Picard was, we treasure your input. <laughs> and having worked on Logan, <laughs> you know, the sort of old man Logan storyline for the X, uh, mm -hmm. X-Men, mm -hmm. where he and Wolverine are the last mutants, really, of the old guard, and, and they're sort of running out. Uh, it, that was a brilliant James Mangold movie. and. Yeah. They sort of pitched him, I think, uh, that's the rumor anyway, that it's going to be sort of like Logan except for Picard. Hmm. And it's not at all. Yeah, hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see how Strange New Worlds turns out. That's, I mean, the, the Strange New Worlds is the, is the Captain Pike show they're going to be doing. And the one thing that I find delightful about that is just that it's a show where the pilot was shot in 1964 and it's greenlit in 2020. Mm -hmm. But it's still written by Akiva Goldsman. Yeah, well, that's the well, issue. 
well, there you go. You know, so uh, we'll just see. We'll see what we see. You know, I mean, again, uh, you know, they, I mean, Paramount, CBS Paramount views Star Trek as um, uh, commercial property. I mean, it's it's just like if you had an apartment building and you try and put tenants in it who could pay the rent. It's they're, 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 I mean, they only really have Mission Impossible and, and Star Trek, I think, as their two franchises. And uh, and so they're just trying to squeeze money out of it, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they're not trying to. And, and, here, and here's another problem, uh, or at least another challenge. Uh, those of us who create science fiction, whether it's it's Tracy or me or Rod Serling or Gene Roddenberry or any of those people, or or uh, Joe Stefano, who I worked with as well, and and you and you were uh, mm -hmm. he was one of your mentors, Tracy. We're not trying to just we're not trying to just turn a buck. That's not our objective. We're trying to shake things up. We're trying to create shows we haven't seen before, have 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 things that interest us and entertain mm -hmm. us and and are meaningful to us. And but the but the very um, uh, rebellious quality of science fiction, the, the, the you know, is what they don't want because if it's if it's not just sausage coming out of the sausage machine, it's going to offend somebody. It's going to get mm. people writing in letters angrily, and that's the last thing that mm. any corporate corporate entity is going to want. They don't want controversy. Whereas certainly Gene Roddenberry wanted controversy when he created Star Trek. He was he was trying to say something meaningful. Mm. As was Rod. Rod was the reason Rod did Twilight Zone was because mm. he was so censored writing for the other shows, and he thought if I write science fiction, it'll slip by the censors, and it and it actually worked. But uh, but you know so that's the problem that that the, and that's why the more that they do franchises the more that they just stick with what's safe, the harder it is to get good films and good TV shows through. And every now and then you do get a good one like Logan, which was very good. But but that's the exception to the rule, I think. Mark, when did you work with Stefano? Um, he did Swamp Thing, which was not a good show. Oh, yeah. It was not a right. good show. And I did not have a happy experience with it, but he really was an astonishing guy. And I'm a huge Outer Limits fan. And of course, he also yeah. did Psycho. I, with Psycho, I had the chance to get to know Joe Stavano and also Robert Block. And that was really, really fun. And uh, mm -hmm. but Joe, Joe was an astonishing writer. And, and uh, Outer Limits is an amazing show. I mean, the original one, it's uh, yeah. the, the, the reason I'm a writer today is because of Twilight Zone, Star Trek, and Outer Limits. Those three shows, they That's were amazing. Identical with me, other than I would believe it or not, take Star Trek out and put the prisoner in. But Star yeah. Trek would not be far behind. Yeah. Um, hey guys, yeah. guys uh, can I, do I have time to tell you a quick Joe Stefano story? That's pretty oh, interesting. Oh yes, please. Are we, do we have time or are we? Absolutely, yeah. sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Joe had broken we, We've his got a whole, a whole other and, hour, Tracy. Oh wow, really? So Joe had broken yeah. his back and he had, Ow. he was raising a son and he sort of uh, did a John Lennon and decided he was going to stay at home with his son. Right. And he was going to build a staircase from his door down this Ivy Hill side so his son could go down and catch the school bus. Mm -hmm. And he spent like the whole year do doing it. He dropped out of writing, kind of dropped out of show business, and he was trying to heal his bad back. And one mm -hmm. day, there's a blazing hot summer day. And he wakes up and he's so hot, nothing he can do to get cool. And meanwhile, he's trying to get over his bad back. And he turns to his wife, Marilyn, and he says, God, it's hot today. It's the kind of day when people slaughter other people. And she <laughs> went, what? Joe, why? that's the weirdest thing you've ever said. Why do you say something like that? He goes, I don't know. That night, just basically feet from his front door, down the hill from his house, she was the Sharon Tate murders on the wow. same night that he wow. said that. Right. Yeah, wow. and uh, it just gave him the chills to even think back on it because it was this thing he was feeling in the air that he couldn't even explain. Wow. And that's what wow. happened. He lived on Cielo Drive, which was yeah. the place where the Tate house was, yeah. Wow. Anyway, yeah. now that I've cheered us all up. <laughs> But that's but but you know that that's the amazing thing. I mean, it's it's such an honor to be part of um, this this dream factory. You know, I mean, Sharon Tate. Of course, you know, if, if Sharon Tate had just been an unknown person or pa Polanski had been an unknown person, we probably wouldn't be talking about that mm. all these years later. You know, it's sort of like we we get to be part of something amazing. And even even Sharon Tate is in a really great uh, film that Polanski did called Dance of the Vampires. You know, so again, mm -hmm. whatever. Or Pardon me, but your fangs are in my neck. Yes, yes, and and but yes, but the thing is, we are so lucky that the work we do 
lasts and can be appreciated decade after decade and far beyond our lifetimes. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. an honor. It's such an honor. I mean, I'm, you know, it's, uh, uh, we're both so lucky to have had that experience and to continue to be having those experiences. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a dream come true. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think you're yeah. right. Tracy, yeah. I, I'm a big a fan living. of Roman yeah. Polanski. And I love mm -hmm. the fearless vampire killers. And PJ, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Tracy, with, with, and just getting back to what you were describing about the uh, the new premise for uh, for sliders, uh, does that mean that there is a certain degree of retconning towards what was done at the very end of the five seasons? A certain degree of, of what? Of retconning? Sorry. Is there of like are you uh, are, are you the retcon the show? What is that? Yeah, just elaborate on what that like, means. Basically, exactly. are you are you going to not take into account certain things that were happening in season five of Sliders, for example? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, the uh, the main thing we're going to change, we're going to take a step back on the Cro-Mags, and mm. we're sort of not going to make him make them the uh, everyday sort of rival of our yeah. people. So we are going to sort of go back, take a step backward on that. Um, and then if there's other things, which we'll look at the fifth season, there are certain things that cr crossed the line and made certain reality. It's a retroactive continuity. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the continuity from the origin of the show. And, uh, I'd love to tell you guys the real plot, but... Tracy, they tell you me froze up for a second. Could you now? go back about 20 seconds? Sorry. Just uh, what was slide into the past. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's very important to me that we try to, once we establish certain do's and don'ts and rules, that those are not crossed, that those yes. are not eliminated. Um, I would say maybe with the Cro-Mags, that's an exception. Mm -hmm. We might make some changes that eliminate some things that were said in the fifth season. But in yeah. general, we're trying to stay very consistent with the rules of sliding from the very beginning. Yes, um, and that's, I knew that was back. kind of important from well, Gene Roddenberry. Back. Yeah, well this is well, this goes back to what you and I both learned in science fiction like when I talked to Matheson, you know, he said, you know, you put in like in Twilight Zone, you put in one drop of fantasy and then you play it out as realistically as possible. The the point is to what to set rules and then follow those rules because otherwise if anything goes then the story is just completely out of control. It's 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 there's no interest because anything can happen. Totally right. So you, totally right. So mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, you know so that was. But the the great thing about sliders, the really fun thing about sliders, or among the many fun things, were the fact that you could think about okay, if we were in this world but it had this twist or this change, it was very Twilight Zone-ish in that way, and it could be a historical change or it could be a societal change or any number of things, you know, and uh, and then you just play it out and you see what, what happens. And I also love the fact that you could have duplicates of your own characters. So whereas Quinn would have to be sort of a heroic kind of character, I did one episode where uh, it was called uh, um, uh, World Killer, where Quinn, uh, there's a duplicate of Quinn in another parallel dimension where he turned on his device and instead of sliding him to another world, it slid, slid everyone in the world other than him to another world. And for the last several years, he thought he would, he just, he'd killed everyone, uh, all humanity. He didn't know they slid to a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And so and so he was a much mm -hmm. less, uh, he was a more irresponsible person. And our guys show up and say, no, 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 you've slid the entire population of Earth to another planet, another Earth. Let's go see what you've done. And we go to this other, Earth, where the population mm -hmm. doubled, doubled in a moment, and so. Um, but the fun part was to have the, the duplicates of of Quinn, where you could play that out. Very, very fun. And uh, I don't know if you had the same experience when you were doing sliders, um, Tracy. But there was a there was a sort of stand-in for for Jerry who looked so much like him that literally, if you just glanced mm. at him, you thought it was Jerry. I mean, he. And so, so when we did mm. the doubling on World, when we had the doubling on World Killer many shots where you have the two of them in the shot, you think it was us doing a, a, a VFX shot, but no, it's actually this guy who really looks like him. Really? And him. Yeah, it was phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, so that, I don't know if you had that experience when you were shooting, but, uh, but we did, yeah. The Leviathan says, oh my God, I remember the show, The Slide Wave. <laughs> yeah, but the fun, but also a big difference between when Tracy did Sliders and I did is Sliders was shot in Canada when when you guys were in production for those first three seasons, and then season mm -hmm. four they brought it back down to Universal. So we were on the lot here in LA, mm -hmm. which was 
fabulous because my Deep Space Nine episode shot the same week as one of my Sliders episodes. So I actually got to be to get a photo <laughs> with both casts, both casts the <laughs> same day, in the same clothes at two different at lunchtime. Uh, it was great. It was just great. So <laughs> yeah. Um, Tracy, we do have it a was, question. Uh, yeah. Would the sure. reboot be filmed in Vancouver? Very good question. We definitely want to set the show in San Francisco, which is mm. where it has always mm. been. But yeah. San Francisco, the union, the unions were so out of control. We couldn't film it there at all. We had yeah. to go to Vancouver and pretend all year that it was San Francisco. Anyone yes. that knows San Francisco knows that it's not. But yeah. it's still going to be set in San Francisco. And well, you can where still we're do end exterior up shots and things, right? Yeah, we, we, we set a second unit around for about a week, shooting yeah. all, all kinds of San Francisco stuff and using it throughout the year. But um, as to whether we'll shoot it again in Vancouver, I would personally love that. I really enjoyed Vancouver. So, mm -hmm. But no decisions mm -hmm. have been made yet. We don't even yeah. officially have a show again yet, so... Yes. Intensified still, uh, says, on hold. I ask because I live there and would try to be an extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll look well, you up. Funny. Yeah. It's funny because <clears throat> so few shows are shot in Los Angeles. You know, back back in the day, back in the 60s, you know, live TV emanated mm. from New York and then and then film television was out here. But then for mm. financial reasons, they started moving to Canada mm -hmm. and then, you know, Atlanta and so forth. And so most actors aren't in L.A. even if they live here. And when they're shooting, and uh, mm -hmm. so I'm, my studio is one of the few that actually is here. And so I can say to my actors, "Hey, you get to sleep in your own bed. You know, you get to be with your family, and uh, that's a that's a big plus." Yeah. But uh, you know, but yeah, I, the but actors I hope, aren't the only ones that are leaving California. Yes, Sorry. but I, but I I really right. hope the executives I hope the executives huh. do see do do listen to reason and greenlight your show because again, it's like I'd watch that show. I'd watch you know I'd be curious what you'd want to do with it, and also. You're the creator of the show. You you have legitimacy. You know, it's sort of like, you know, there's so many people where you say, why did they give that person the reboot? Why did they have someone who had no um, affinity <laughs> for the material, you know, put in charge? And so again, mm -hmm. I for me, for me having Tracy Torme, you know, do a new a new version of Sliders is a no brainer. You know, obviously. And Thanks. I'd like to point out Thank here that you. Sliders fan blog has a change.org petition with mm. over 4,000 signatures mm. on it mm. to bring back sliders. Wow. Kidding? So, no, uh, I'm not amazing. kidding. Mm. And his no, question yeah, is... A lot of work for that. Was there any other idea for yeah. the original timer than a phone? <laughs> Well, it wasn't really a phone. It, I mean, I guess in some ways it kind of looks like a modern phone. Um, <laughs> you know, we had a a guy that made all the little gadgetry on sliders, <laughs> and he's the one that cooked up. Sorry. Tracy's internet is freezing momentarily, <laughs> and we'll ask him again when he unfreezes. <laughs> Just one here? of those things. There okay, yeah. yeah. Can you Am answer back? again, Tracy? Yeah. Yes. yes. And I'll, I'll be right back. Hang on, just okay. Yeah, it wasn't meant to look like a phone. It just kind of turned out that way uh, by the guy that made those devices for the show. And he froze again. This happens. We just have to be patient. Could have marketed it as a toy or something, but we never did. And Tracy, I'm answer? sorry, you froze Hopefully again. You said it wasn't designed to be a yeah. phone, but oh no. Uh oh. Can you hear us, Tracy? And you froze again. Um, Just yes. before you were going to tell us, it wasn't supposed to be a phone. I don't know where everybody is in the country right now, but where I'm living now, it's unbelievably hot. It's probably like the hottest day of the year. Mm. Is it hot with wow. you guys everywhere? Yeah. In it's northeast Kansas, Kansas, it's a right? brisk 
63 yeah. degrees. Ah, uh, so it's chilly. Oh so, my yeah, God. In I'm LA, jealous. it's almost on. Yeah, in LA, it's almost 100. So uh, yeah, but wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep. Well, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have, well, we it's a pretentious around. heat. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, mm-hmm. Tracy, did you want to finish oh your God. thought on yeah. the uh, the gadget? I don't really have a lot to say about the, the, the design of the timer. It was basically mm-hmm. based on a quick description in a script, and they did a good job with it. I was happy with what they did. It looks a bit like a cross between a walkie talkie and a telephone. And that mm-hmm. certainly, you know, fit the purpose. Yep. Gentlemen, there's there's something I saw in sliders that I haven't seen in any other show, and I was wondering if you guys could have just uh, shed some light on it. Um, there was, for example, sure. and I saw this throughout the first four seasons. Um, if you had an episode that had to do with a certain, like, with had a certain theme in it, let's say it had a train in it for whatever reason, mm-hmm. um, then right back to back to that. There would be another episode that had somehow that train theme. I'm just choosing a train. It, it was something else. But that had the train theme in it as well. It, was there some kind of reasoning to, to back-to-back, uh, including themes like that? Or do you guys even not? Well, do, do you mean in the case of, have like to kind of know what Mark was saying before, sets yeah. or props? Well, no, in, in, in our case, in our case, because we were on a studio lot, we had standing sets of a hotel. And so each week we would find a rationale for that hotel to appear in some fashion in the parallel mm-hmm. world. There was one that I tried to get them to do where uh, we would be in the hotel one week and we'd pull out through a window and it would be a Zeppelin. <laughs> and we actually tried to get footage from Hindenburg that we could use in, uh, you know, from the movie The Hindenburg <laughs> that we could use, use to that purpose. But, uh, but ultimately it became like, well, do we really want to spend this money on that? It was like, well, no, I guess not. But um, so, so, so you might see a similar set. Sometimes you might need to redress something that you built to uh, basically amortize the cost. So I, on another show that I was on, we had a submarine that we had to build a set. And they said, well, can you do another episode set on a cargo plane? And we said, yes, because then they could just re- re- redress that set. And mm. that, because it was too expensive to build with one week's budget, but two weeks it would work. But that's, that's really the only thing that, that comes to mind. I, I don't know, Tracy, do you have any thoughts on that? All I could say, I hope this, I'm not sure if this answers what you're asking, but a lot of times uh, budget plays such a big part. People don't fully understand that, that sometimes there are things you really want to do and they work and you really want to do the scene. You know, it works. And then for some reason, it's just going to be too expensive to do this or that about it. So the whole scene gets junked. And that happens to every writer. I mean, it happens to everybody. And it's yeah. sad, you know, because something you think you mentioned oh, the show Carnival. I think I wrote a scene in Love Carnival. Carnival. Yeah. Thought it was incredibly funny. Yeah. And I was really excited about seeing this scene. And different members of the crew had read the script and they were all coming up to me and cracking up about the scene. And then we couldn't we just didn't have the money for it. Yeah. It got axed and we never shot it. And those things I'm sure happened on sliders. Quite yes. a lot too. It happens at every show. Yeah, so. yeah, but because because one has to remember that TV requires it, it doesn't have the same budget as a feature, so you have to really find ways to um, make a dollar stretch. And and but also television is much more about the characters. You have to cue into who these people are, and that's again, you know, we, where like having uh, Jerry O'Connell was so terrific because he was so wonderful as Quinn because he had that enth- that enthusiasm, that energy, that intelligence, mm-hmm. and I mean, he, and, and he was really, the year we were doing the show, he was very committed to the show and, and directing as well as acting. And, uh, you know, it was like, mm-hmm. you know, he was, and the cast was, you know, very solid. I, uh, sadly, you know, Arturo left before I was on the show because, of course, John Reese davies I had lunch with him, interestingly mm-hmm. enough, around that time. But, uh, but of course, John Reese davies mm-hmm. was a phenomenal actor and still is, you know. And, uh, but again, you know, you, you, Cue into these characters. You love them. You want to take the journey with them. That's that's how TV works. Whether it's Kirk and Spock or 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 Quinn and Remy, you know. And Tracy, we do have a couple of questions. One well, is, you guys know that I'm still very. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Tracy. What? Are you talking to me? Yeah. 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 You said I'm just to talking. let you guys know. 
and I stepped on you. Oh, I was going to let you guys know that I stayed. That's okay. I've stayed very close with Clevant Derricks and his whole uh, family, basically. And he's oh, wow. now playing the wizard in The Wiz and touring the wow. country. Oh, that. that's cool. So Great. That's he's having a lot of fun. That's he had yeah. been in Dream so Girl. The question is, are him. there any plans so to develop the, yeah. the Benish and Logan St. Clair characters? Oh, boy. You know your stuff. Uh, Benish character was always a favorite of mine. I love the idea of a total stoner pothead who all, can also build a nuclear bomb. And he's sort of the bane of Arturo's existence. So I mm-hmm. like that character a lot. Um, I would love to bring him back. Um, I'm not so sure about Logan St. Clair. Mm. But you never know. And Mara Kitty says, Sliders was a cute show, but how will they replace John Davies? Yeah, John Reese davies yeah. Tracy? John Reese davies um, Yeah. Yes, it's built into the new the reboot. Um, what's happening with Reese davies I mean, with Arturo, at the beginning of the reboot, it is addressed, and we're not just going to have him disappear as a character. Um, Good. And John is... Funny, when John was working on the show, he had this kind of reputation of being difficult, quote unquote, and the network was really all too eager to jettison him. Hmm. Hmm. And did did you feel he was difficult uh, personally? Oh, are you frozen again, Tracy? You may have to re ask uh, when he. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I said, I don't know how your experience with Kari were was. Curious well, about the, that. it was it was good. It was good. Here, you know, sometimes actors are viewed as difficult when they're simply responding to the fact that the material, the scripts aren't solid, or there's some, pr- or, or their character, the the um, integrity, the emotional in, uh, continuity of their character is being sacrificed for a gag or whatever. And so it's very important. I I, I view actors as my collaborators, and so I listen if there's a problem. I may not always agree a hundred percent, but with with Kari. Yes, she. The problem I had with her was, you know, she was supposed to be this military person, and and she didn't couldn't handle a gun and so forth. She wasn't credible, and so I looked <laughs> at other. But I, so right. what I did, I looked at Anaconda, which she was in, and I said, oh, she's able to actually, mm-hmm. she's a good actor. She can actually deliver. And and I said, mm-hmm. what is she doing? What is she doing that she does well? She could be playful. She could be funny. She mm-hmm. could be loving. She could be warm. So I I then wrote to those qualities in her. So, because I was writing to her strengths as an actress, and then she was very happy with with the show and with what we were doing because we were giving her things to do that she could do, and um, you know. So again, jo- you know, John Reese Davies is a is a very strong actor, and I I don't know if you had difficulties with him, Tracy, but um, but the net the network may the network often often people who aren't um, artistic they they blame the messenger for the message and that's how someone gets a reputation as being difficult hmm. when they're just trying to make something good you know and you know so i have i think what you're trying to say is that the suits don't get it and it's not always the suits it can also be a producer <laughs> or a writer on the show you know it can be peck and paw one thing i wanted to tell you tracy uh that uh, regarding david peck and paw and again this is not to speak ill of him but yeah. um but the yeah. first thing I want to do, the, the very first week I was on the show, I said to David, well, the first thing I want to do is watch all the episodes you've done so I, I could maintain the continuity mm-hmm. of the show and of the characters. And he said, oh, we don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. And so so I and, and well, slider, that's exactly like what happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the result, I was writing scripts and try and in time in the time I had the free time I had. I would try and watch old episodes, but mm-hmm. they weren't on home video. So, you know, so I had to like talk to, you know, an editor or whatever to get like, you know, tapes of the show. But, um, but so I never, uh, to this day, I have not seen all of the episodes of Sliders. And, uh, and, but my, my due diligence well, had, been, Mark. yeah, you know, I would have liked to have seen that them. That sounds so like I'm, exactly what happened. To- yes. Yes. And again, that you know, sounds I'm, like I'm exactly proud. what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm I'm proud of the I mean, I just that. can't believe when you're. Yeah, I can't believe that when you come on a show and you're new to that show, which happened to me on Carnival. I did yes. the same thing you were doing when I joined Carnival. I had never seen the show, and I spent right. two days over the weekend watching every episode to catch up, 
And yes. of course, that's what we do. We do it for a living. So yes. that's yes. only natural. But the fact that David wasn't interested in that at all, yes. I, it just blew my mind. I never could figure yeah. that out. Um, and so, but and so uh, what, about yeah. Reese Davies, by the way. Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please. tell. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I got along fine with John. John was temperamental. Mm -hmm. And he drove sort of the network people totally crazy. But I always sort of had a, uh, a an affection for him. He was temperamental yes. about things, but he was also perfectionist. He wanted to do a really yeah. good job. Um, yeah. And I remember one night there was a stunt that Arturo's character had to do. He had to roll underneath a Jeep or something and come. You just cut out Tracy. If you could repeat that. Sorry. Could you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, you said he had to roll underneath a Jeep. That usually happens too. The second time he freezes again. Yeah. Mm. Am I okay now? Yeah. We yes. Can hear you. So he was. I don't know what you roll guys heard. I'll make it as fast as I can. Yeah, he was supposed to roll under the Jeep and get up the other side. First, they sent his stuntman in. And they sent a guy in with a fake beard, and he had a pillow under his stomach. And yeah. Arturo was totally, I mean, Arturo, Reese Davies was totally offended. And then he got yeah. very macho, and he said, I don't need a stuntman. I can do the goddamn thing myself. We all yeah. backed off and said, you sure, John? No, it's no problem. It's a piece of cake. So he rolls under the Jeep, and before he comes up on the other side, we hear this loud clang. And he banged his head on the undercarriage, yeah. and everyone on the crew could not help but bust up. And he came out on the other side trying to be all dignified, and his head was bleeding. And oh, but oh my I gosh. tell that story because John was mostly fun to work with, and yeah. I, in the years since Sliders, he has really mellowed. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a classic case of somebody that reaches a point in life where they become very mellow about things. He's moved to the Island of Man. That's where he lives now. Mm -hmm. And I've had some really nice conversations with him and he's changed in a lot of ways and for the better, in my opinion. But, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it looks yeah. like he was always a really great Jones, actor too. I was sorry when he left. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention yeah, that uh, yes. PJ has very done an that, entire rewatch yeah. of the entire show of Sliders uh -huh. and he had a question. Wow. Uh, I, yeah, well, um, you guys have answered a lot of my questions. I I, I really find uh -huh. uh, season five difficult to watch. Yes, um, and that, and again, I'm, I don't want to be negative at all. Um, I, I I do think that um, in the world we are now, I think we the any sliders that you that you put out, Tracy, I think might be uh, has the potential to be such high quality that um, I'm so looking Thank forward you. to it. That's very nice yeah. of you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to do it. I mean, I think it's a really good time. Um, it's really funny, guys. I don't even think I told Gil this. I, about 12 or 15 years ago, I did a magazine interview, and this guy was asking me to make some predictions for the <laughs> future, sort of in sliders fashion. Uh -huh. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, well, I think we might end up having a second civil war. So huh. I, I really could see that happening. Now, wow. when I said that, it was sort of an off-the-wall thing, and people thought, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> but now I heard a guy the other day saying he's a, he was a military guy. It doesn't even matter which side he was on mm -hmm. because I won't get into the politics. But he said, I've been thinking lately what it's going to be like to take up arms against my fellow Americans if I have to. Hmm. And that's the first time I've heard anyone in the military say that. Wow. But it seems to me we've been in. Hmm. It's always at the most interesting time <laughs> that this happens. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There we go. It seems to me that. You hear me? You're back. Yeah. Okay. It seems to me that uh, we might be heading toward legitimately a second civil war. Um, mm. There may be two factions that are so polarized and of course i'm not saying anything we don't all yes
and I don't really know if I really thought it would happen. And, probably not. Sorry, Tracy, you froze. Yeah, yeah. And you said, oh, no. don't do it all. Uh-huh. I said mm-hmm. what? You said something sorry? like, you, you, you froze after you said something <laughs> like, don't Should do I it all. say it like this again? Okay. Uh, no, but we just all didn't I'm saying hear what you is, said. All I'm saying is that now, if a slider staff had the freedom to mm-hmm. tell stories, to tell the best stories without yes. worrying about political correction, correctness, without yes. worrying about offending anyone, without worrying about the politics of the day. If we had yes. that freedom, it'd be a great time to do slider stories. As Roddenberry used to tell me, he only created Star Trek so he could tell stories on other planets that he couldn't tell here on Earth. If you said yes. that Just on like another the planet, Zone. you could stay... Are we back? Yeah, you're back. But we missed what you said. I don't want to totally repeat myself. I, so I'm not sure what you guys heard, but well, you I just think if you had the freedom. Yes. Go ahead, Mark. Well, you know, the funny thing about that, Tracy, is that uh, you know you always have to be careful of what you, fiction is different than 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 the real world. If we had created a science fiction writers, you and I, if we had ever created a president like Trump before Trump existed, they would never have allowed that. They would they would have said no one could be that. You couldn't have someone like that as the president of the United States. Right. And, and so, but once you have someone like Trump, then you can have a field day in science fiction, mm. you know, riffing on all that stuff endlessly. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, but again, I agree with you. I mean, I think there's, the, the, see, the thing about sliders is there's always grist for the mill. No matter when you are, any given year, there's always going to be things to comment on. There's always going to be things to um, be inspired by. And, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's 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 it, it was a wonderful um, toolbox. It was a wonderful toy set, you know, to to play with. And one thing I should mention, just as a, a an added information, is that although David wouldn't let let me take a week or two to watch all the episodes, I did read all the synopses of every episode that had been done. Mm. So, done so I knew that. And in my spare time, as much as I could, I was watching the older episodes just to get mm-hmm. aligned. And uh, because again, I felt a strong um, obligation to honor honor the show as much as I could. And then, but it was very funny because when I was told what the fifth season was gonna be, that Jerry had left and so on and so forth, I thought, boy, I think that's gonna be a train wreck. And so now when people say, yeah. well, were you there on the fifth season? I say, no, it was good <laughs> well when I was there. I mean, the show was, was still good when I was there. But, um, but the, yeah. interesting challenge, the, the interesting challenge we had on our season was that, that Jerry asked that his brother be included as a right. character on the show for like, I think 17 right. of the, too. So Bill Dial and Chris Black and I were just like coming up with all these different alternatives of who he could be because he he looked a lot like Jerry and we didn't want it to be the same mm. as Quinn because then you'd have two characters <laughs> serving the same purpose. And finally, finally, um, Bill Dial said, well, how about he's from like Amish world? And that worked mm. because then he, then he would be mm. the one saying, well, what what is radar? What is a telephone and all that? Mm. And it allowed you a way to have exposition. But again, just like with, with any actor that I haven't worked with before, I would write scenes for him to see what he could do and what he couldn't do. He was very sweet as a person. He was a really nice guy. He wasn't the actor that Jerry was. And so the the, the acting chops, I would, you know, the, the difficult the difficult acting scenes I would give to Jerry, but his brother I would uh, I would give, you know, other things to that, that allowed him his best qualities to come forth, you know. So that was mm-hmm. I'd never had that challenge before working with uh with two members of the same family in, in my cast. Mm-hmm. Charlie was you guys uh, know that uh, less experience than Jerry. What's that? I said uh, so Charlie you, was less yeah. experienced than Jerry. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Do but you really, guys know that uh, Clavant Derricks has an identical twin brother? Really? And no. We found that out oh. halfway through the second season, oh my and I god. said, "Oh my god, we got to do something with that." So we did an episode where the two Rembrandts meet each other. From wow. two different worlds and huh. they walk in a circle they do all the usual tricks that they used to do on like wow. the patty duke show or something <laughs> where you're showing we did that on purpose but in fact it was a real guy that looked like Clavon. Wow. That was that's amazing cool. yeah that's it was great. amazing like the hand yeah. on the mirror yeah that's <laughs> did right. tell you that mark that he had a twin 
No, I didn't know mm -hmm. that. That's that's fun. I mean, <laughs> Linda Hamilton. Linda, Linda Hamilton has an identical twin sister, and they used her in a scene with a mirror in. Uh, that's right. For mm. minute two, which was was great. But again, you know the. Uh, I mean, all of this stuff is just so super fun, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and the trick is always to say, well, how can I bring variety to things? How can we do different stories and 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 shake it up and have it still be interesting? And and that was one thing the sliders really allowed you to do because it, you could each week it was like a different world, a different. You could there were there were no limits as long as it was a good story. You know, you could you could go to you know any any place that where there was a good story to be told utilizing these characters. You know, it was I, I well, love working on it. Mark, you know, uh, the one place where if I had not had some bad feelings towards the network and David Peckinpah in particular, where I should have stepped in to help the new staff, you and yeah. the other guys like Bill, and mm -hmm. it's on the character of Rembrandt because mm -hmm. it yeah. was always a weird uh, thing for the network. They never really understood it, and I know that because... We had talks about it. Rembrandt was really supposed to represent a uh, clueless show business guy filled with the wanna celebrity wannabe, but uh -huh. he's past his prime. Uh, the band that he was in, the spinning tops, was a mixture of the four tops and the spinners, uh -huh. and he was the lead of the spinning tops a little a few years ago. He was known as the crying man because he crying cried man. real tears in every performance, right? Huh. And, you know, it was such a delicious character. It's hmm. sort of like, you know, the other three characters were going in this orbit and he was sort of going in the other, another orbit. Uh -huh. He only went sliding because his Cadillac was sucked into it on his way to sing the national anthem, uh -huh. right? Yes. And I really felt like that would be a really tough character to write for or to get right because we could have some really good science fiction writers on the show mm. yeah. and they really wouldn't really kind of get where the black humor satire of Rembrandt was. Yes. So I felt like as time went on, Rembrandt sort of became just more of an action figure. He yes. got involved in fights and it's, but it's true. the whole and, and sort of show business yeah. angle kind of yeah. got lost in the shuffle. It's not well, your is, guy's fault because yeah. you know, that's no, something but, I should have come in and talked to well, you about. But it, and again, I think this is this is a very interesting aspect because it was only when I mm. I talked to you about that character that back in the day and found out that that was that was derived from people you've known in the mu music industry because your dad was Mel mm. Torme and so you were mm. writing it was very easy to misunderstand that character and think he was a, an insulting mm. black stereotype because he was a, the only right. black character on the show but that right. wasn't what you intended at all you were trying to comment right. on a very specific kind of personality as an in individual and yeah. So originally, Mark, he was originally yeah. like a borscht belt uh, <laughs> Jewish comedian. That wow, was the man. original character. Then I, I turned him black. Yeah, but you yeah. know, it was you know it was a weird thing because if you do, you, do you go back and watch the original pilot? You told me yes. you think you did, right? Yeah, yeah yes, um, I did. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's the thing in the original pilot? I was going to tell you that happened with Rembrandt. Um, hmm. Uh, I had a thought in mind, but it's gone now. Um, but again, that was obviously a tough character to write for. Yes. And the uh, the um, network was really down on that character from the very beginning. Not yes. that they didn't like him. They thought the idea that he cried real tears all the time was funny. But mm. they just were sort of saying, this is a sci-fi show. Where does he fit into this? Mm. And I had it in my head that I knew it could work, you know? Yes. But I also knew it was going to be, um, it was going to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Unconventional. Yes. Um, and, and, so. and, that, and by the time it got to me on the season, on season four, my thought with that was that um, because I didn't come from the world that you came from, because I hadn't seen mm -hmm. real life exemplars of that person, I didn't want to do something badly. <laughs> but so, mm -hmm. so, 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 it's, so what we did was, yeah, as you say, we pulled back on some of the elements of his um, personality, simply because I didn't want to be writing something that I, where I'd be drawing from stereotypes rather than from personal experience. And so that's yeah, why if, if you and I just sat and talked. It's a, shame, it's a shame that I wasn't more diligent about coming in and maybe but, but getting a few great. of you guys in, in a corner for an hour and talking yeah. about it. 
But you know what? By then, I was so alienated from Peck and Paw yes. and what was going on that I just yes. and, went on. I was the, actually developing other shows at yes. Warner Brothers for like a couple of years. Yeah. Um, uh, Tracy, yeah. Uh, yeah. Slider's fan blog asks, wasn't Quinn originally supposed to have a sister? No. <laughs> Not unless there's something I don't know about Quinn. No. Not in this Easy enough. I mean, he may... I don't, there's maybe a slim possibility that in a script it said that he had a sister that had died young, but yeah. not like a permanent sister, not like they were in the same family together. And that reminds no, not, me, no. the, yeah. the most, uh, looking for the, the right word here, not nostalgic, but um, the one that means sort of down. Hmm. Um Anyway, the the episode that left me feeling that way, the word that I'm looking for, someone will help me with it, I'm sure, was huh. when, you know, every time they slide, uh, he goes to the fence to see if it has that squeak, right? Mm, yes. And that's the way he knows that, you know, he's home. either home or not home, yeah. Yes. And then when they actually get back to Earth Prime... Mm. They've done some WD-40 on the fence, huh. and he opens it, and it doesn't make the noise. And he's like, "Oh, okay, well, yeah." Have to. Gil, are you slide talking again. about the squeaky gate? Mm. Yeah. Gil, talking yeah. about yes. the squeaky gate. The squeaky gate. I'm yeah, sorry that I was said a little fence. device. That was a little device that we all went back to, and it was fun because they land on one world where they have to slide again. And uh, Slider's fan blog says that was the end of season two premiere Into the Mystic. Mm -hmm. And then they find out it was just oiled and it was squeaking before and they and, were home. Uh, Tracy, and I'm again. sorry, you dropped out again. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Uh, we did a world where they landed on the world and they only had about an hour to mm -hmm. take off again or they're going to miss the window. And they think they're at home and they try the gate and it doesn't squeak. And Quinn decides we're not home. They go again. And the last scene is someone comes out. You show that they've been oiling the gate. And it <laughs> is the same gate. They were actually home. So, yeah, wow. we played yeah. with that uh, squeaking Wistful. gate. We played Thank with that you, Jill. That first. was the word I was looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah, that but was fun. Yeah, and it was it was just it was you know the actors were great to work with and Cleavant you know even when we mm -hmm. changed him and brought brought his character down a bit, he was such a wonderful actor and 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 mm -hmm. so you know so collaborative. I mean it was it was I've I've never and, and and I've been very lucky in my career. I've never had problems with actors because I come to them mm -hmm. with respect and enthusiasm and and I listen you know and you know mm -hmm. if an if an actor says to me well I'm having trouble with this line or you know I'll say well. Let's talk about it. And the only reason I would mm -hmm. say, well, we have to say it this way is if it's, if it's specifically to trigger something down the road that we need to have this information. But generally, if they say, well, I'd rather say it this way, I'll say, sure, that's fine. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, an autocrat in that way. And, uh, and I, I'm always amazed at, at writer producers who view actors as the enemy because, my God, they're your <laughs> collaborators. And if they don't do a good job, you're going to look, you know, no, no matter how good a script is, if the actors suck, you're dead. So you want them to be, be bringing their a, a game, you know, and, and that comes from respect all around, you know. Yeah. And so uh, because we're in the second hour, uh, this is when guests, uh, you know, uh, the chat has a, a chance to ask questions of the guests and intensified says, would Tracy be interested in the reboot exploring worlds that the Sliders originally visited 20 years ago? Oh, well, that's a really creative question. I think it definitely, I think we should, if we reboot the show, I think we should take a look at previous worlds. There's no reason they can't stop there again. Yes. So I think that's a, a great question, and the answer is yes. Mm. And Elihu says, if Sliders gets a reboot, will it be more scientifically accurate instead of Hollywood technobabble? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have to ask him again when he unfreezes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but of course, you know, because we haven't proved that there People. are... Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, Tracy. So go ahead, Mark. Um, go ahead. 
We just try to consult uh, you, with scientific you people. You froze, and we, we didn't hear your answer. Yeah. If Slider gets a reboot, yeah. will it be more scientifically accurate instead of Hollywood techno babble? Okay, it, it is often Hollywood techno babble. I can't. And that's the second that usually follows. Mm. And I think he was saying there's. I I can't do anything about that. Well, I I can speak to oh, that boy. as well. I, I can speak to that as well because yeah. you know, it hasn't been proven that there are pal parallel Earths. You know, that isn't established science. However, it's, since it's sliders theory. began, yes. I think the many worlds theory has gained mm -hmm. a great deal of popularity. It's possible. Right? And it's not, yeah. it's, so it's not like, you know, now they have definitely proven there were exoplanets, so one can extrapolate from that. But with parallel dimensions and going to other Earths that have duplicates of our characters, that's speculation. So, so you know, no matter how you you uh, dress it, it's still going to be speculative uh, because of that. But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't tell a great story. Uh, science fiction, that's what science fiction is about. That's why it's called science fiction. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, we're always extrapolating and coming up with things and finding scientific or pseudoscientific explanations. And that's that's fine. And uh, Donnie Pichal says, need to know what happened to Rembrandt. Hmm. What does that mean? I think what I think I don't know. When, yeah, what 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 if you're going to bring him back? If he's going to be, you know, oh. they just want what happens. Yes, I, I couldn't see doing, I couldn't see doing a reboot without uh, Rembrandt because again, uh, we my wife and I are pretty close friends with uh, Clavant and his wife and his yeah. son, who played cornerback for the Atlanta Falcons for a while. Uh, uh, he's got a pretty talented family. We yeah. talk to him all the time, and yeah, I wouldn't do the show without Rembrandt. Hmm. Mm, yeah, great. that's great. Yeah. Um, let's see. He cries. Um, he cries real tears at every performance. <laughs> that's his shtick. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's great. <laughs> I actually wrote a song for the show called "I've Got Tears in My Fro" because I'm standing on my head over you, and he <laughs> sang it with the spinning tops, and uh, it was a lot of fun. That's great. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, somebody mentioned that earlier. Mm. The mm -hmm. tears in the fro. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing, by the way, just to speak to that for a moment, mm -hmm. what is great about television now in general is the greater inclusivity so that you can have multiple black characters and so forth. So again, when you're able to do that, it means that you can have black characters who are individuals and are not representing the race, you know, and not, not, so in other words, uh, you know, that allows a character like Rembrandt to work much better because you can, you can cast such a wider diversity of, of, of people, you know, and Here, uh, here's the explanation of the question. Rembrandt jumped in a wormhole at the end of season five finale, and it was postulated that he might die from the slide. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you know, was, well, go ahead. I did well. I think, oh, I think yeah, people, I are, that. people are going to pretty much ignore season five. I think it, it kind of. I know, think you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. It's. Uh, I mean, that's the lovely thing with science fiction. You know, now that you can just sort of decide where you're going to like pick up the story, and and what's canon and what's not. You know, so that's fine. People, people will. Love you know, that. Uh, Gil, you asked one of your viewers asked a question yesterday about Robert Wife, whether he mm -hmm. was going to be involved or not, mm -hmm. and. He's dealing with some personal issues. I talk to him pretty frequently, sort of give him an update on what's going on. As of right now, he's not going to be directly physically involved, but he's always out there kind of throwing his two cents in, and mm -hmm. that's his involvement right now. He's a really good guy. You know, a lot of people don't realize before he worked on Slider, he worked on um, the Blues Brothers was his uh, movie, uh. and so were all the Naked Gun movies. Huh. How fun. For all his Yeah. Uh, that's great. He's got a really amazing yeah. comedy back. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and, and um, com yeah, comedy Mark, really I was gonna ask you oh, yeah, uh, what are your favorite episodes of <laughs> Sliders and why? Uh wow, that's a hard one. Um well you know, I'm I can only really speak to, to the episodes I wrote because um those are you know the ones that I had the most fun doing. Uh okay. so so that would be Slide Cage and World Killer are my two favorites of the ones I wrote. Uh, but but you know, but it was, there there 
even even in other episodes, there's there's things to enjoy, and there's always, you know, character bits or or, or some extrapolation. I mean, there's there's, there's just the, one of the fun things about sliders is just the the variety of stories we were able to tell, and uh, you know, so so that's again where I know that if they did let Tracy do his reboot, I think it'd be a great show because there's just so much there. It's a universe. See, the thing about science fiction that's different from like a western is that a science fiction creates a universe or in this in this case a multiverse and so it's any story that you can envision can be done and and the greater the, the the lower cost of visual effects means that you could even have sliders on a much bigger scale than back in in the 90s because mm -hmm. you can afford to do more and uh you know so i think mm -hmm. I, if i were an executive i would just say yeah okay here let's let's push the green button and go you know but uh sadly i'm not in that position of power but uh, but maybe I can tell uh, you Tracy guys the, uh, needs oh. to buy a copy of your book Greenlighting Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but go ahead, Tracy. You were you were saying something? Okay, can you hear? Yeah, yes, yeah, you can. Go ahead. <laughs> and. Scene. Yeah, there we go. Well, it's frozen again, but you know. So maybe we just get a twofer, and he won't freeze the next time. Maybe, maybe, but still great to hear all of this stuff. And I, I you know, I mean, it's it is it's wonderful. And and you know, uh, there are certain people who are really the uh, really the the geniuses of the genre. And Tracy is, you know done so much and it's the it's thing so i really wanted to ask the both of you mark yes. is that tracy was friends with harlan ellison yes. and you were friends with harlan ellison yes. and i kind of wanted you to both tell us some juicy harlan ellison stories well, well i guess we'll start with you well interestingly enough behind me on the wall is a portrait i drew of harlan when I was a teenager, and that's actually on the Harlan Ellison website as his portrait. So that's pretty, pretty cool. It's just like right over that 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 side, and uh, and Harlan was a huge influence on me. I mean, I I just uh, I he I went to Clarion, the Clarion Writers Workshop, because of him. I learned how to write and what what why it was important to stand for something. And uh, he was hugely influential on in my life. I'm uh, very very sad that he's no longer with us, or and that that his dear wife Susan also passed away not long ago. I mean, it's, uh, Harlan was one of a kind. I mean, they're just like Ray Bradbury. There's certain people where there, there's only one of them. And when they're gone, they're gone. That's it. And, uh, um, so I, I miss Harlan very much. I, I was hugely grateful that I got to know him. And, uh, you know, I, uh, he was an angry, angry man, but, uh, but a wonderful guy too. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys. Hi, Tracy. And Tracy, hey, everybody. I was just asking Mark, that both of you are friends or were friends with Tracy Torme. Harlan Ellison. And, I'm sorry, with Harlan yeah. Ellison. Yes. I get yeah. them confused very easily. And if you could share some stories about your friend Harlan Ellison, I think that would be really cool. I'm back. What are yeah, you saying, great. Gil? Can, can yeah. you share some stories about your friend Harlan Ellison? Because Mark was also friends with Harlan. Oh boy. Um, very sad toward the end. He was not very. He was ill. He wasn't very well. I found out at a world con that he couldn't even sign his name to a book. Wow. 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 Sad. Um, sad. Yeah, we miss him. You know, um, we, I hope that his wife is doing okay. She was kind of alone and forlorn when he died. She seemed. Yeah. Very isolated. Um, yeah. I was just I, saying to Robin the other day, we've got to call her again and see how she's doing. Yeah. How close well, were Susan's, you with him, uh, Mark? Yeah. Well, um, he was hugely influential in my life. Sadly, Susan passed away, Tracy, and uh, that was a big, big shock. And uh, but, um, but no, he was an amazing guy, a phenomenal man, and uh, and we're we're all better for him having having been here. You know, he created science fiction shows that made me want to. Uh, want to write science fiction so yeah but susan died in her sleep and it was very sudden and she wasn't that old it was one of those shocking things i think probably the stress of of losing harlan you know uh, was a big factor it was really a shock 
Evidently, Tracy's very shocked. Yes, but uh, yeah. I said, but, how old was he when he passed, Mark? Do you know? Harlan. Harlan was in his early eighties, and uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Susan. Was, yeah, Susan was in her sixties. She was yeah. a lot younger yeah. than Harlan. But uh, they were they were a wonderful couple. I mean, Harlan was sort of a ladies' man until he met her, and then she was the love of his life. She was the one, and uh, and she would yeah. you know stand up to him and 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 answer back. And they were they were wonderful yeah. together. And, and uh, I'm glad yeah. that they got to have each other, you know, for as long as they had each other, which was a couple decades. Yeah. And uh, but uh, right, but yeah, but it's it's always sad when we lose these these amazing writers like Rich Ma Rich Matheson and Richard Matheson and uh, yeah. George Clayton Johnson, all these amazing writers who inspired us, Joe Stefano, you know, but, uh, you know, but we were all made of, you know, water and meat and, and it wears out, you know, but fortunately. Ugly our, bags of mostly water. Yeah. Yeah. But thank God, thank God their work remains. I mean, City on the Edge of Forever and Soldier and uh, Demon with a Glass mm -hmm. Hand, all these great things that Harlan wrote for television. Amazing. As mm -hmm. well as the book, the short stories and the essays, you know. So, Without which the Terminator would never have existed. Yeah, well, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right? That but, sure is. Mark, yeah. before we forget, uh, can yeah. you uh, just give us an? Because uh, I don't, I, I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, can you give us an update on where uh, Space Command is at and what you guys yeah. are? Yeah, we were just shooting on Sunday. Uh, we've recorded seven hours of Space Command. We're shooting the next hour. We've begun shooting the next hour. We've built an alien spaceship set. We're building two eight-foot-tall creatures. We're going to be shipping the Blu-rays and the DVDs of the first two hours by Christmas. And uh, so we're almost done with all the visual effects on the first two hours. There's 1,800 visual effects shots. So, wow. so we're, we've written the rest of the season. Our plan is to shoot the rest of the season uh, at the top of the year. And uh, so we're going great guns. It's going great, really well. And then with the Showrunners Network, all those other five series that we're creating, uh, we're going to, you know, we've had the table read on Sweet Haven, which is the show I'm creating with Rock Neil Bannon, and that has Gates McFadden and Bob Picardo and um, Barbara Bain in it and, and Veronica Cartwright. It's an amazing cast. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can't wait to roll camera on that. So, uh, so yeah, no, everything's going great. And I think people are going to love when they see the, the two hours put together. Uh, they're going to really love it. And then we did a bonus episode during the pandemic where the actors shot their own scenes in their own homes. Right. With their cameras. And mm. that was our bonus episode. And that was really fun to do as well so and so, mark i wanted to ask you about mr sci-fi yes. your youtube page has yeah. hundreds of videos many yeah. about working with luminaries like ronald d moore and harlan ellison yeah. how to yeah. write and sell tv yeah. shows movies and books life yeah. lessons from rod serling ray bradbury and guillermo del toro yes. a one-day class it's a veritable treasure trove for creatives in genre fiction from page to screen and beyond what made you to decide decide to create a channel where people could learn from the benefit of your experience across so many disciplines? Well, it's funny. A couple of years ago, I was having uh, lunch with my friend uh, Glenn Mazzaro, who was the showrunner of Walking Dead. And we were just talking science fiction. He said, you know so much about science fiction, you should have your own YouTube channel. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. So I, I started it. And my rules for it were, for the most part, I just turn, it, turn my phone camera on myself and record. And so it's very low uh, effort in terms of technical side. And, um, but then I can also post Space Command episodes or I had the entire movie of Things to Come and I did, then, then I did an audio commentary on that and I recently had um, a Russian TV version of Solaris that I presented. And you know, it's just, it just allows me to talk about movies, TV, books, comics, anything I want to talk about within science fiction. And uh, I have a great time with it. And uh, you know, because uh, you can have videos that are a minute or, or, or videos that are two hours. And, uh, you know, and, and also so many people have told me stories that are not publicly known. I, you know, Ray Bradbury finally told me the story of how he and Rod Serling um, stopped being friends, how they fell out. And I'd heard about that, rumors of it, but neither of them talked about it publicly. And so Ray finally told me. So I, you know, I once Ray was, you know, I knew that Ray enough time had passed that Ray would be okay with me telling it. So I told that story on Mr. Sci-Fi and it's fascinating because Bradbury was so um, central to the writing team that came about because the three writers on Twilight Zone, Matheson, Beaumont, and George Clayton Johnson were all his protégés. And so Ray, you know, so that's how Twilight Zone got that a phenomenal team of writers on, on the show, you know, so amazing stuff. Um, I, I love the history of science fiction and I love, I mean, science fiction is the only medium I know of where you can go 
to these conventions and meet your heroes, the actors, the writers, the directors, the producers. Um, I mean, I because I started going to conventions when I was a teenager, because I, I, like you, Tracy, I'm sure you noticed that the same writers who were writing these wonderful books were writing the TV shows you loved. You know, it was all, it was all Matheson and Beaumont and Harlan and, mm -hmm. you know, so forth. And uh, on Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, Star Trek, and... Uh, and if I may say, the same for my generation with you guys and you well, yeah. two in particular the yes. fans become not the establishment but the writers look yes. at harlan elson he yes. started out as a fan became one of the new wave writers yes. and you guys in specific have continued that tradition and i yes. think that's fantastic well we're part of it thank tradition. you and you know about harlan an interesting thing um and because obviously we, we both really miss him he mm -hmm. was a treasured friend to both of us, I guess, in a lot of ways. Interestingly enough, a lot of people wouldn't believe this, but he was the most anti-UFO guy that I've ever <laughs> met. He was so anti. He was yeah. so anti-UFO that if I started a conversation with him about something about it, he immediately shut it down. He didn't want to hear it, and so yeah. it wasn't just that he didn't believe in it, which is definitely true, but he found something. Uh, offensive or threatening about it the same with ray bradbury by the yeah. way and yes. the same with gene roddenberry they were yes. both that way and yep. uh it's interesting because i tell people gene roddenberry they say how can you say gene roddenberry didn't believe in ufos <laughs> believe me he didn't yes <laughs> he did yes. he got mad at and me we have a, a, time a question over it. from brian yeah. s who says he would like to see an episode of the Stargate Travelers bumping into the sliders. <laughs> PJ, your thoughts? Um, <laughs> hey, listen, I mean, uh, you guys should talk to uh, Brad and Joe, uh, Brad uh, Wright and Joe. Brad Wright. <laughs> yeah. It, it is, uh, what, 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 what show is Brad Wright working on? Is it still uh, Brad Wright Stargate? did Stargate SG-1 and Atlantis. Well, and well, uh, you know what? Malazzi. I've never, on the new star. I've never met him, but I definitely noticed that he was my favorite writer on the New Outer Limits, and uh. I did a couple of them myself. But I never ran across him. But his stories were always amazing, and I kind of wondered what he was like. Yeah, wow. As a person, do you, do you guys know him? Seems to be a nice guy. I've met him a couple times, and uh, you've one met thing him. Is yeah. yeah, he seems to be a good guy. And also, in terms of crossovers on sliders, one thing, one episode I actually did consider, and I uh, was a sliders episode where, where they would slide into the world of It's a Good Life, the Billy Mummy episode mm. you know, of Twilight yeah. Zone. And I actually had lunch with Bill Mummy at Universal when I was producing, when I was a producer on sliders to talk about that. And I think I even outlined that story. And um, wow. it would have been super fun. Idea. Yeah, it would have been yeah. great fun. It never came to fruition, but, uh, but but I've worked extensively with Bill. He's in Space Command now, and just um, wonderful, wonderful guy to work with. So, uh, but yeah, but but Bill, again, that yeah. Speaking of Bill Mummy, I was at a convention once, and I ended up. I was supposed to be a speaker there. I ended up waiting for about uh, four or five hours backstage, huh. and who was in the dressing room with me for four or five straight hours of incredibly. <laughs> wonderful conversation with Jonathan Harris. Wow. And he, you know, Mr. Dr. Smith, yes. he was the nicest guy. He was also a Jeopardy freak. If <laughs> Jeopardy was coming on, he stopped whatever he was doing to watch it. And oh. he knew all the friggin' answers. He was absolutely brilliant and wow. wonderful. Yeah, that was quite something. Wow. Um, do you guys ever bring Brad right on the show, Gil? Um, Have you I would love to. Uh, yeah. I'll let PJ uh, answer to that. We've, PJ, uh, do you know him? I we don't know Brad, but uh, we we've done a lot with uh, with Joseph Malazzi. Uh, he's been the uh, mm. he's I think he was one of the driving forces behind Stargate. Um, mm. You know, he's working under Brad's umbrella, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. he's a showrunner of his own uh, in his own right and, mm. and the creator of Dark Matter. Hmm. Um, so, um, I mean, at one point they, they talked about a dark matter, uh, uh, Stargate crossover. Hmm. So, but yeah. these, hmm. these guys are, these guys are, you know, they're very creative and they're very open to ideas. So, you, you know, and they're very cool ideas. Yeah. Have fun. That's fun. Well, great. So, um, so I'm going to have to peel off in a, in a couple minutes, but just so if there's fi anything final we, uh, you guys want to ask, I'd be happy to answer it. 
Mark, when you sign off, can you sign off saying Space Command the way you do? Space <laughs> Command. And well, the, the, yeah. where that actually comes from is one of uh, a show that I love yeah. is Space Patrol, Space Patrol from the 1950s. I met the I met the star of that show many years later, and he was wonderful, and the head writer as well. And they used to go Space Patrol, and uh, <laughs> so that's a little a little tip of the hat. But uh, but I, I can't I can't tell you how much fun it is to have your own studio. It is just uh, you know. Quite wonderful, and uh, you know. Many congrats so, on that. Man. Yeah, and Tra and Tracy, feel free to follow up with me if you if you have questions about Twilight Zone. Th these guys will be able to give you my number and all that stuff. I'd love to. Oh, that'd be great, Mark. I do have a couple I want to ask you, and maybe do a yeah, little bit of reminiscing want, about Harlan. We can yeah. just hang out yeah. a mm -hmm. little bit once we've ended the stream, mm -hmm. okay. and we can you know have a little behind the scenes chat. <laughs> Uh, we're right at the two hour mark. Mark, I will be so, I will be calling you. I do want to. Great. There's I, something very specific I want to ask you about. So okay. that sounds great. I uh, great. I do want to thank both of you for a wonderful show. Yeah. Uh, thank you, buddy. You're both uh, inspirations to me, and I'm sure to PJ. Absolutely. And uh, there are a lot of thank fans you, uh, yes. that are rabidly interested in your work, Tracy, and your work, Mark. And yeah. thank you both for being on uh, again. Thank you, Gil. <laughs> on Masters yeah, PJ, of the Genre. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, for everyone on the you guys panel, guys, have a great night. Thanks. Uh, thanks. It's Cardinal Sin. <laughs> out. <laughs>